All right. You got that respiratory quiz? Okay. Here we go. I'm going to explain to you how oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported in the blood. You got me? What number is that? Seven. Number seven. Also, I put a video on about how oxygen knows to bind to the hemoglobin in the lungs and let go at the cell. Yes? Um, and I'm going to explain that today, too. Okay, ready? All right, hang on. Okay, here we go. Watch. What's the smallest air sac you got in your lungs? How uh, thick are alveoli? And you better, you know this, right? Every alveoli is associated with a pulmonary capillary, right? So the blood from the right side of the heart is getting pumped to the lungs, and that blood is low in oxygen and high in carbon dioxide, ain't that right? And then the air that you breathe is high in oxygen and low in carbon dioxide. So high to low, yes? Okay, here we go. Can you dissolve a gas in a liquid? Yeah. Can you? Yes. See those little bubbles in there? That's carbon dioxide. Can you dissolve a gas in a liquid? Wait, it it's in there. See? Do you see any of the gas over here? It's in there. So can you dissolve a gas in a liquid? Yes, you can. Right? That's why it pop pops. When you shake it up, that will release the carbon dioxide. This ain't got no fizz to it. Say yeah. So that's how a pop goes flat is the carbon dioxide comes out of solution. Don't that look like a pee stain? Go a little bit. I'm not wiping that off either, ever. <laughs> Ready? Okay. Write this down. One of the ways that oxygen is transported in the blood is dissolved in the plasma. And that is measured as a partial pressure. And a partial pressure is abbreviated P. So have you ever seen this, PO2? Have you ever seen that? Well, you will. Have you seen it? Yeah. You read? If I had a thermometer, I'd check your temperature. You might have a fever. So, watch. One of the ways that you transport oxygen is dissolved in the plasma. And about 2% of the oxygen that you transport to cells is transported, dissolved in the plasma. Why is that important? Let Timmy tell you. Write this down. Never forget it. What's the blood mostly made out of? Water. Good. And it's not pure water. It's 0.9% 
sodium chloride. What's another name for 0.9% sodium chloride? Normal saline. Say yes. Okay, watch. Watch. A person comes into the emergency room. You're working there as a nurse, right? And blood spurlating out of their neck. Can you look at that spurlating blood and say, that's A negative all day. All day that's A negative. Can you do that? No. But it takes time to get blood from the blood bank, type and cross match it, and start delivering blood to that patient. In the meantime, they're bleeding their own blood. Say yes. But you just learned that plasma is mostly what? Normal saline. And you also learned, watch it, what's one way you can transport oxygen to the cells of your body? Dissolved in the plasma. And what's plasma mostly made out of? Normal saline. So when the person comes in and they're spurtulating their own blood, you stop the spurtulation, yes, and then you put big old IVs in them and you give them normal saline and then you give them a higher percentage of oxygen. That will be enough oxygen you can transport to the cells until you can give them the right type of blood. That's why it's important that oxygen can be transported in more than one way. Say yes. Watch. The biggest and best way oxygen is transported in the blood is in or on a red blood cell. Red blood cells are red, Reb. Red blood cells are red because they're called red blood cells. Now watch. Anybody got a hoopty? No? I had a 1974 Chevy Nova. It was a rust bucket. Rust is the result of paint coming off the iron and the metal and oxygen binding to it. So the reason blood is red is inside a red blood cell, you have iron. What's the chemical formula for iron? FE. Are you with me? And that, you better write this down, that iron is embedded in a big freaking protein inside a red blood cell called hemoglobin. And I'm going to say this really slow. Watch. I'm going to say this really slow. There is a protein inside a red blood cell called hemoglobin. It is. It looks exactly like that. I stayed up late last night, even though I was sick, memorizing the configuration and shape of hemoglobin. Embedded, embedded in the heme portion of hemoglobin are four atoms of iron. Are you with me? And each atom of iron is capable of binding one molecule of oxygen. So how many molecules of oxygen can each hemoglobin molecule carry? Four. How many molecules of hemoglobin are in one red blood cell? It's more than four. No, it's a little bit more than eight. How many molecules? This is one molecule of hemoglobin. How many molecules of hemoglobin are one red blood cell? 
No, more than one. More than eight. How much? Two hundred and fifty million. <laughs> That's why I said it's a little higher than eight. Two hundred and fifty million. Yes, there are two hundred and fifty million molecules of hemoglobin in one red blood cell. So how much oxygen can one red blood cell carry? A ton. What's the best way to transport oxygen down to the cells of the body? Bound to the iron on hemoglobin. Say yes. And you know this. You just know this. You have to know this. Right? You took health in high school, right? How many people took health? Do they still teach health in there? You know that there is A, B, A, B, and O blood types. You know this. Right? You know, uh, you know that, right? So because people have different blood types, you have to make sure that you're giving that person the correct blood type before you can administer blood to them. Say yes. That's why it's important that oxygen is transported in the blood in more than one way. And again, the best way is bound to the iron on hemoglobin. Say yes. Write this down. This is the only thing you will ever remember from this class. This thing I'm about to tell you next. How long do red blood cells live? How'd you know that? It is. Yeah. That is so weird. How'd you know that? See, I told you, you probably had this class years and years ago. Red blood cells live 120 days. What's the goal of the body? So when a red blood cell dies, you've got to make a new one. And the bone marrow makes new red blood cells. Now, what, I'm just going to show you this. Don't write this down. Just listen to this. You got me? Watch. This is a red blood cell. How do you know? I'm writing red blood cell. What's the protein inside a red blood cell called? Hemoglobin. Right? What's embedded in the heme portion? Iron. Are you with me? Okay, watch. How long do red blood cells live? 120 days. So when they're about to die, and they do die, Watch, this is what happens. They go to the liver, the spleen, right? And that red blood cell membrane is ruptured. Boom. What does it reveal? Hemoglobin. Are you with me? In the liver or spleen, that hemoglobin, you're not going to believe this, is broken down to heme and globin. Ain't that cool? What's embedded in the heme portion? Iron. Watch it. So when the heme portion gets broken down, it gets broken down to this chemical compound called Billy Rubin. What color is Billy Rubin? Yellow. Tell me you got that. Who's following this? So if you get a really bad bruise because you were lifting up your textbook, and you damage blood vessels, red blood cells will start leaking into the skin, the interstitial spaces of your skin. Are you following this? And those red blood cells will start to get broke down. So after a while, that bruise starts to look purple. Then it starts to turn yellowish green because you're breaking down that red blood cell in the heme portion. Say yes. Now, watch. 
What doesn't a fetus do that you do? They don't breathe. So little feti have different hemoglobin than people hemoglobin. So when the kid pops out, right, and the doctor picks him up and slaps him on the butt, and the kid's like, what the? They have to get rid of that fetal hemoglobin, and sometimes that little baby liver gets overwhelmed, and it can't break down the bilirubin fast enough to bile. So the bilirubin starts backing up in the liver, then the blood, then the tissues, and the baby turns jaundice. Tell me you got that. The, uh, the Billy Light, that takes the uh, Billy Rubin, breaks it down to urobilogen. That gets into the blood, and then they pee dark for a couple of days, and the kid is straight. Tell me you got that. Tell me you got that. What? what, what? The urobilogen? The baby's hemoglobin is different than our hemoglobin because they don't breathe. So the liver has to break down those little fetal red blood cells when the kid is born because now he's breathing or she. You got me? So sometimes that little baby's liver gets overwhelmed with the destruction of fetal hemoglobin. And bilirubin in, a, in your liver, my liver, that gets converted to bile. And then you crap it out. That's why turds are dark. Most days. And that's because there's bile in it. If we didn't have bile, your turds would be white. A bird eats plants. That's why when they crap on my Jeep, it takes a paint off too. It's white, right? They don't secrete a lot of bile. We secrete a lot of bile in our crap. Say, yeah. So, <clears throat> Watch. If the bilirubin can't be converted to bile fast enough in the liver, then the bilirubin starts backing up. That's why people with liver failure develop jaundice. Say yes. You're following this. And just so you know, if you're jaundice, that's not good. You should write that down. All right. So what are the two ways oxygen is transported in the blood? Dissolved in the plasma, and how is it measured? The PO2, partial pressure of oxygen. What's the other way? Right, but it's bound to the iron on hemoglobin. So watch. What do women do that guys don't do? They don't have a period, right? So women tend to lose iron, so they develop what's called iron deficiency anemia. So when women are having real heavy periods, they tend to be tired all the time because they can't carry enough oxygen. Say yes. So what do you do? <laughs> you do what? Sleep late, right. And then, then get really cranky, too. <laughs> I'm just playing. How many people followed, followed this? You got that? Okay. So... That's how oxygen is transported in the blood. You got me? Now, carbon dioxide. Where do you make carbon dioxide? I'm giving you a hint. Good. So one of the byproducts of metabolism is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide will go from high to low. So it will go from the cell into the blood. So one of the ways to transport ox, uh, carbon dioxide in the blood is dissolved in the plasma of the blood. So it is a partial, it's measured as a partial pressure of carbon dioxide or PCO2. So that's one way. Another way is bound to hemoglobin, but it it's not bound to the iron on hemoglobin. It is bound to the amino group on hemoglobin. So carbon dioxide binds to this guy right here is an amino group. And then finally, and in advance I'll explain how this works, 
it is transported as this. What's that? What is that? By car, carb, I can't even spell it. Bicarbonate. That's bicarbonate. Say yes. So carbon dioxide is transported three ways in the blood. Bound to the amino group on hemoglobin as bicarbonate and dissolved in the plasma. Say yes. Boom. That's how oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported in the blood. Watch it. Watch it. Yes. Yep. It gets broken down into bicarbonate. Yeah. You're going to learn that in advance. That's a little chemistry, and I don't want to teach it here because people will they'll start having a seizure. This is the abbreviation for hemoglobin. That's how oxygen's transported. You got me? See, this is what's referred to as a softball question. Right? Not hard, but important. Carbon dioxide, three ways. Three ways. One, dissolved in the plasma. And how is that measured? PCO2. Number two, bound to, what's this? The amino group. They open up for Menudo at Summerfest. Menudo. Remember Menudo? Bound to the amino group on hemoglobin and then transported in the plasma as bicarbonate. Say yes. All right. I'm going to write this down for you. <clears throat> if someone gets this as a tattoo, I will give you tons of extra credit. As a matter of fact, I will give you an A on your respiratory quiz if you tattoo this permanently. CO2 is an acid. Anybody willing to get that tattooed permanently? Really? You have to get it like, what do they call this, a tramp stamp? There you go. CO2 is an acid. Get that tattooed. All right, did I explain how oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported in the blood? I did. Let me see that respiratory quiz. I'm killing this thing. Thank you. I wish I could see. Okay. The next one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain to you this takes into account literally everything that you've learned up until this semester. Ready? Hang on. I want to show you something. There's a flash sale at Dick's Sporting Goods, too, just so you know.
Three re oh uh, yeah. Well, that's because I stink. Did I spell my name right? Yeah, okay. Don't it look like Adam John does there? My liver's failing. Okay, here we go. Watch. Watch. I'm going to answer the question right now. How oxygen knows to bind to the iron on hemoglobin in the lungs and let go when it gets down to the cell? I have a video on that, specifically on that question. Say yes. yes. So this one's worth 150 big ones and no little ones. You got me? What number is that? Number six. And it's going to be on the respiratory quiz, just so you know. Okay? Now, think about this for a minute. Think about it. Where do you want the oxygen to bind to the iron on hemoglobin? What part of the body? Where do you want that oxygen? What part of the body do you want oxygen to bind to the iron on hemoglobin? Where? In the lungs. And where do you want the oxygen that's bound to the iron on hemoglobin to let go? At the cell. Say yes. What's hemoglobin made out of? What's the hemoglobin molecule made out of? It's made out of protein. And we learned, I'll never forget it. It was a Tuesday. I'm almost sure of it. That proteins are temperature and pH sensitive. Ain't that right? And that if you change the temperature or pH, you will alter the shape of a protein. Ain't that right? Okay, that's very good. Here we go. So you have a red blood cell. And know this, red blood cells are so big that when they get into the capillary, they have to do the la cucaracha. They go in one red blood cell at a time. Are you following? Here we go. What's the molecule inside the red blood cell? And what's embedded in the hemoglobin? Iron. I'm only going to put one iron. You know there's four. Say so yeah. Okay. Where is there a lot of oxygen? In the alveoli. Boom. I better label that. And this is the P. Diddy. Or just Diddy. That's the pulmonary capillary. Okay, so watch. Because the alveoli has a lot of oxygen, it is going to cause oxygen to bind to the iron on hemoglobin. Are you with me? Who's with me? Guys? So now you have oxygen bound to that iron. Where does all of that newly oxygenated blood go to after it leaves the lungs? The left side of the heart, right? Through what vessels? Nice, nice. See? You can never forget that. Who's going to forget that? Bensi, you going to forget that? Never. You could see right there. She looks at me like, what, are you out of your mind? Of course I'm not going to forget that. Right? I get it. All right. Hang on. Get this thing out of the way. Look at that. That's in the way. You ever look at this video? And just like rock back and forth? You should do that. Okay, here we go. You're going to get this. So now we have a red blood cell. We have a red blood cell that is saturated with oxygen. Say yes. 
and all of that newly oxygenated blood is now going to come back to the left side of the heart. Ain't that right? Okay, watch it. Watch it. What are the byproducts of metabolism? That's right. Heat, CO2, hydrogen ions, ADP, and these cells are lacking oxygen, at least once they start becoming more metabolically active, right? So what do these do to the arteries that supply those metabolically active parts? It will cause them to dilate. So when the little left ventricle contracts, you have arteries that are constricted and arteries that are dilated. Where's the vast majority of that oxygenated blood going to go? It's going to go the path of least resistance, and that is the arteries that are dilated. Say yes. So let's say it's your arms. You're reading the textbook. You know, I better give you a scenario that could actually happen. That's a couple. Okay, so watch. Watch. As that red blood cell starts moving towards the most metabolically active parts of your body, what's the protein inside a red blood cell? Hemoglobin. So the most metabolically active parts of your body are going to produce increased amounts of heat. Are you with me? What's going to happen if the that those cells start producing more hydrogen ions. What's going to happen to the pH? It's going to go down. Very good. So we learned that hemoglobin, hemoglobin is a protein and that it is temperature and pH sensitive. So watch it. So as that red blood cell starts getting closer and closer to the most metabolically active parts of your body. Yes? What's going to happen to the temperature of that blood? It's going to rise. What's going to happen to the local pH? It's going to drop. And when that happens, it changes the shape of hemoglobin, and it will not allow the oxygen to bind to the iron anymore. And that oxygen will fall off and go from high to low into the cell. Tell me you, you followed that. You got that. How many people followed that? No. What? And I'm going to say this really slow. The more byproducts of metabolism you produce, the bigger the arteries will get. If the arteries get bigger because your cells become more metabolically active, the left ventricle is going to be sending more oxygenated blood down to those cells. Are you with me? And because those cells now are becoming more metabolically active, they are going to produce more heat and they're going to produce more hydrogen ions that will drop the pH even more. And if you produce more heat and lower your pH, it will change the shape of hemoglobin even more and more oxygen will fall off the iron on hemoglobin and go into the cell. Do you see this? So it is metabolism that dictates blood flow and oxygen delivery to cells. It's perfect. It's perfect. Now watch. When a surgeon does surgery, that's what a surgeon does, surgery. They cut into body parts, true, and blood will bleed. Say yes. If you are interrupting arterial blood flow to a particular part of the body, do you want that body part being metabolically active? 
That's why it's cold in an operating room. They want that person's body temperature low because the lower the body temperature, the less metabolically active that person is. Say yes. Watch. You pro- guys are probably too young for this, but remember William Shatner, Rescue 911? The little kid, right? Him and his father were ice fishing, and they spent all day trying to dig, you know, cut a hole big enough for their boat. Forget it. Anyways, the kid falls through the ice. He's under the water for 20 minutes. They pull him out like a little rag doll. They bring him to the emergency room. They put him in this microwave with their lean cuisine. They warm the kid up, and he's straight. Do you understand that? So the lower your body temperature, the less metabolically active you are, and therefore the less byproducts of metabolism you produce and the less oxygen you need. Tell me you got that. Watch. Last night I had a fever. I was delirious. You know what I did? I read the textbook, so I knew I was delirious. How do people breathe when they have a fever? (laughs) They breathe faster, don't they? Why? Because metabolism is sped up when your body has a fever. So now you require more oxygen. Say yes. That's why you need to know that hemoglobin is a protein. Ready? If you get this right... Oh, hey, how much extra credit did I say that uh, little lab thing you turned in? What? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's a difference maker for a lot of people, that extra 5%. Wow. So if you do bad on this with that 5%, I'm telling. Okay. Watch. Watch. How many people had a cup uh, cup of coffee this morning? If your coffee's too hot, besides blowing on it, what could you do? You could put some ice in it. Say yes. All right, so watch. Blood, blood, blood. Come on, blood. Write this down. I'm going to say it real slow. Where does all the venous blood of your body ultimately meet? the right side of the heart. So the venous blood from the metabolically active parts of your body, the hottest parts of your body, are, that venous blood is going to return to the right side of the heart. But it's going to mix with the venous blood from the cooler parts of your body. So what's going to happen to the temperature overall of the blood in the right side of the heart. It will cool off. Say yes. And we learned. What's a byproduct of metabolism? We learned this. What is it? What else? CO2. And CO2 is an acid. So watch. What's going to happen to the overall temperature of the blood when it gets into the right side of the heart? Will it be cooler or warmer than it was in the most metabolically active parts? It will be cooler. And when that blood gets pumped to the lungs, what are you getting rid of? You're getting rid of CO2. So you are getting rid of acid. So what's going to happen to the pH of the blood in the lungs? It's going to go up. So when that blood gets pumped to the lungs, the temperature of the blood is cooler and the pH is higher because you're getting rid of CO2. Say yes. So when that hemoglobin, when that hemoglobin, that red blood cell gets to the lungs. 
hang on, where's the lung? That hemoglobin is going to change its shape back where oxygen is able to bind there. Tell me you followed that. So it is heat and pH that determine whether oxygen will bind to the iron on hemoglobin or let go. So if you understand that at the cell your pH is lower and the temperature is higher, that causes oxygen to unload from hemoglobin and go into the cell. And when that blood gets pumped back to the lungs, the temperature is lower and the pH is higher, which allows oxygen to bind to the iron on hemoglobin. That's how oxygen knows to bind in the lungs and let go when it gets down to the cell. Say yes. And again, the more metabolically active you are, the higher the temperature is going to be in those cells and the lower the pH. And that will change hemoglobin shape to unload more oxygen. So it is metabolism that dictates your physiology. Say yeah. How many people have ever been on an hospital, that's Spanish for hospital, um, or like an emergency room where they put the little clothes pinny thing on you? What that's measuring is the amount of oxygen bound to the iron on hemoglobin. So it measures, it measures, the little thingy thing measures oxygen saturation. Saturation, it's going to slow it down, of red blood cells. And if you have healthy lungs, you got healthy lungs, when that blood, those red blood cells leave the pulmonary circulation and come back to the left side of the heart, 96 to 98 percent of all of the iron in all of the hemoglobin should have an oxygen bound to it. Say yeah. So when they do the little pulse oximeter. That's actually measuring the amount of oxygen bound to the iron on hemoglobin. Say yes. Totally with me. That's number six. You got me? Okay. I'm going to take you from the atmosphere all the way down to the alveoli. You're going to trace path oxygen takes, right? Air takes from the environment down to the alveoli. I say, yeah, here we go. Number one, remember, what's that? Remember, right? Always breathe through your nose. Because the air that you breathe through your nose is cleaner than the air you breathe through your mouth. So what I'll be doing when you take in the respiratory test, I'll actually be seeing if you're actually breathing through your nose. And if you're not, I'm going to take points off. <laughs> Corey, you should see the look you have on your face. Like, I can't believe this guy, like, there's something wrong with him. Just so you know, there's there's nothing wrong with me. I'm not even kidding. I'm the most normal person I ever met, if you think I'm lying. Okay, here we go. Number one, air is going to enter the nares, nostrils. Number two, nasal cavity. Here. Number three. Can't believe I'm doing this. Nasopharynx. Yep. Number four. Oropharynx. Number five. 
Number five, laryngopharynx. You with me? Then, past the past the epiglottis. and into the larynx. You got me? Then into the trachea. How many lobes does the left lung have? Two. How many does the right? Three. That's good. Here we go. i got to find it first. Where the hell is it? Oh, here it is. Trachea? Yeah. Then you have two main stem bronchi. And then... Each main stem bronchi supplies air to the right and left lung, respectively. And then the main stem bronchi branch off into lobar bronchus, meaning each one of these lobar bronchi send air to a particular lobe of the lung. And then the lobes of the lung are further divided into segments. So then you have the segmental bronchus. Are you with me? And then the segmental bronchus, they get divided into smaller airways called bronchioles. Now, not shown in this little diagram, the bronchioles then further divide into what are called terminal bronchioles. Terminal bronchioles. And then the terminal bronchioles go into this sac-like structure called the <clears throat> alveolar duct. So let me, let me explain. I'll show you. Here's an alveolar duct right here, and then you have these one-cell thick air sacs called alveoli. So an alveolar duct, connects a bunch of alveoli. Say yes. Okay. And how thick are alveoli? One cell memory thick. And you better write this down and better include this in your answer. Every alveolus is associated with a pulmonary capillary. And this is where that external respiration occurs, the exchange of gas between the environment and the blood of the pulmonary circulation. Yeah? All right. <clears throat> Amen. Lungs, lungs, inside the lungs. Moist and meaty, dry as a bone. Moist and meaty, say yeah. I'm going to 
make a student I don't like take this one tonight. Okay, watch. And this is intuitive. This is intuitive. You should know this. Watch. When you take a big deep breath in, what do your alveoli do? That's right. That's exactly how you should have said it. They expand. Say yes. When you blow the breath out, what will the alveoli do? They'll deflate. They tend to collapse. Is it moist and meaty in the lungs? Yes. So when people blow that breath out, the natural tendency is the walls of the alveoli to collapse. And because it's moist and meaty in there, it will cause the alveolar walls to stick together. Say yeah. You know what that's called? The alveoli walls sticking together. It's called atelectasis. Have you ever heard of the term atelectasis? That would be a good name for a rock group. It's here for atelectasis and Slow motion. I like it like that. God, I hate me too. Katie, do you hate me too? You should. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. I grow on people to hate. Okay. How many people followed that? Do your lungs and your little alveoli stick together when you blow that breath out? You develop atelectasis, can't come to class, and you've got atelectasis all over the place. Do they stick together? But do they? Why not? No, the moist, man, that's what makes them stick together. Look, spit and boom. But when you breathe out, they collapse. How come they don't stick together and we all die? Well, I'm going to tell you. What? I'm going to tell you. You're going to get this one right. Watch. Better write this down. In the lining, in the lining, in the inside wall of the alveoli, in the inside wall of the alveoli, there is a special type of cell inside the alveoli, of all alveoli. They're called type 2 alveolar cells. And these type 2 alveolar, alveolar cells secrete a substance called surfactant. And what surfactant does is it prevents the alveolar walls from sticking together when you blow that breath out. Now listen up because this is true. A baby born before the seventh month, they do not produce surfactant. So when that little baby pops out, oh yeah, oh yeah. And the doctor slaps them on the butt. Hey, what the? <gasps> right? When they take that breath in, they will expand their lungs. But when they blow that breath out, do they have any surfactant to keep their alveoli from sticking together? So they go into respiratory distress, and they have to be put on a little baby ventilator. That's why premature babies, if, you know, if they know they're coming early, they know they're coming early. They can actually give the mother artificial surfactant so that the baby doesn't have to be placed on a ventilator. But most babies, they don't know they're coming early. So 
They put them on a little baby ventilator, and they can actually administer surfactant through the breathing tube, so the baby only has to be on the ventilator for a short period of time. But back in the day, before they had this little baby ventilators, these babies died. They, there was nothing they could do for them. Now they got a little baby ventilator. Tell me you got that. They will give them um, uh, synthetic surfactants so they don't have to stay on the ventilator very long. But before this was invented, these babies were, there was nothing they could do. Nothing they could do. So watch. And people, I say, the baby's lungs weren't developed. The lungs are developed. They just don't have surfactant. And you don't start, babies don't start making it until the seventh month. That's why a doctor is always trying to hang on to that baby for at least seven months. Otherwise, the kid, he, he'll probably make it even in spite, but a lot of them have respiratory problems growing up, asthma, stuff like that. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. So if you want to, just uh, for extra credit, you can take some surfactant. How many people got that? Yeah? That, I answered a couple of questions there, didn't I? Bam. I, no, we didn't do that. I, I got my asthma. Did you see my asthma video I put up? I did, you didn't see that? That's some of my best work. Okay. Uh, let me go over that, and then do uh, uh, you guys want to take a break now, or do you? Yeah or no? Go ahead, take a break, and then uh, when you come back, I'll finish that up. Okay, so I'm going to go over asthma. Okay. Let me do this. Now, w one of the things you have to do um, is you got to start kind of applying what you know and what you're learning. We're gonna we're gonna build on that stuff. So this guy is part of the Blue Man Group. Yeah. See the Blue Man Group? That, that's actually pretty cool. It is. Yeah. You know what I wish I would have done when I was little? Went to Bozo Circus. I had a dream one time, actually a couple times, where I would say to Mr. Ned, he was the ringmaster, you know, if I make bucket number six with a hook shot, can I get two bikes? Okay, watch. Watch. Okay, wait. Something's happening. Okay. Now. Look at that matches the blue too. Pretty close. All right, watch. What's the primary function of the immune system? To protect you, right? How does it protect you? You're supposed to say, Timmy, I want to solve the puzzle. It's inflammation. Did I do it right? Oh, sweet. I always worry about that. In inflammation. 
You got me? Now watch. Watch. Where does arterial blood always go? The path of least resistance, right? So write this down. Inflammation starts with dilation of arteries. Which blood is warm? Er, arterial blood or venous blood? Which has more oxygen, arterial blood or venous blood? Good. So watch. If you take a hammer and smash your finger for no reason, <laughs> if you do that, when you damage tissue, it causes the immune system to kick in. And what's the primary function of the immune system? It produces what? Inflammation. And inflammation begins with what? Dilation of the arteries. So if the arteries dilate in the damaged area, that area becomes warm and red. Tell me you got that. Who's following me? All right. Okay. How many people followed that? I, I'll never forget, and I told you this. I, I remember it like you guys remember extra credit. <laughs> like you knew that that was fi an extra 5%, right? I'm like, bam. It was like nothing. Yeah, it is a lot. I can't believe I said that. But now I can't go back on my word. That's awful. Okay. Ready? I forgot what, oh, I told you, I'll never forget, the lining of the respiratory tract, right, very vascular. Remember that? Remember that? I'll never forget it. Very vascular. Okay, now I want you to think, I want you to think. Epinephrine is released as part of your fight or flight mechanism, right? When you get scared, you get epinephrine released. And the function of epinephrine, the purpose of epinephrine is to prepare your body to run or fight to prepare your body to run or fight. What does epinephrine do to all of your blood vessels in your body? Think. It's very good. It constricts them. Okay? Now, here we go. Here's the big question. What happens to the amount of cartilage in the respiratory tract as you move deeper and deeper into the respiratory tract, what happens to the amount of cartilage in the airways? What? Is there more cartilage in the airways or less? Less, right? And when you get down to your bronchioles, whoops, hang on, I'm going to find it. There they are, you little bronchioles, too far. Now that's not all, oh, look. These guys right here are bronchioles. Are you with me? Better write this down. Bronchioles. Oh, some of them. Hang on. Write this down while I'm redoing this. The bronchioles are made of muscle. And what are the two things that muscle can do? Contract and relax. Okay? What does epinephrine bind to to exert its effect on the cells of the body? That's very good. That's incredible. Okay, so watch. We're going to look at the 
bronchial. The bronchioles are made of muscle. And on the muscular wall of the bronchioles, in the muscle itself, you have some on a... You have beta receptors. What binds to beta receptors? Epinephrine does. Okay, now watch. What does epinephrine do to blood vessels? Constricts them. In the smooth muscle of the bronchioles, you have beta receptors. They're actually called beta-2 receptors. You with me? What binds to beta-2 receptors? Epinephrine. What do you think epinephrine does to your bronchioles? Do you think it makes them dilate or constrict? Watch. You are going to have to run or fight for your life when you got epinephrine around. So does that mean you have to get more air in and out of your lungs or less? So what do you think epinephrine does to your bronchioles? Say yes. 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 Tell me you got that. All right, so watch. How many people have a cat? Okay, I'm taking points off. <laughs> I am like deathly allergic to cats, right? I had this lady, Can I t just real quick. Her name was Maria Pacheco, lovely lady. She was, when I was at the university down in Chicago, she was the, uh, like the secretary, the office manager type thing. Anyway. She lived by herself, and she wasn't married. At that time, she was like in her early 50s. She goes, Tim, I bought a, a TV at Best Buy, and I had a truck. Could you come with me to pick it up and then bring it to my house? And I'm like, sure. So she lived in this apartment above this dentist, and she had these stairs that literally were like this steep. And I thought she's buying like a little TV, right? She's buying one of these giant console TVs, right? So anyways, before we went to Best Buy... She stopped at her parents' house. And I'm like, I was like, I don't know, 28, 29. And then her parents are speaking Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. So the father comes up to me, starts shaking my hand, you know, and the mother's like, I'm like, Maria, we got to get um, to Best Buy. So as we're going there, I go, what did you tell your parents? I told them that we're getting married. Like, why did you tell them that? Anyways, I get the TV and I'm walking up and she's got these cats and they're like all over me. So I finally hook up the TV, right? And on the way home, I couldn't breathe and my eyes swelled shut. So I had to hold open my eyes to drive home. Anyways, so watch. Write the, please write this down. The lining of the bronchioles is very vascular, right? So there are lots of arteries in the lining of the respiratory tract, yeah? Okay. What does inflammation do to arteries? It dilates them. So if the arteries dilated, they got bigger. Those arteries started getting puffed up. What would happen to the hole in the bronchial? Would it get smaller or bigger? That's right. So if the arteries dilated, the hole would get smaller. Who's following this? You got me? So the arteries would swell and the hole gets smaller. Say yes. So here we go. Let's say you're allergic to cats and you see a cat and you go, here, kitty, kitty, and you pet the cat. 
And then a cat hair ball goes flying, and you suck it in. Now you got a cat hair ball. We'll put that in black because they're bad, right? Cat hair balls. I'm bad for you. You got me? What does the immune system do when you have an allergy? Inflammation. It's an exaggerated immune response. So what's going to happen to all of the blood vessels inside your respiratory tract? Those blood vessels are going to dilate, right? So what's going to happen to the size of that lumen that you can get air in? It's going to get smaller. Say yes. Now watch. And what's going to happen is the muscle that makes up the bronchial is going to begin to contract. So what's going to happen to the diameter of the bronchioles as a result of you being allergic to cats? The bronchial diameter will get smaller. Say you're with me, you're following this. And we learned, we learned that airflow is equivalent to airway pressure divided by the resistance to airflow. Ain't that right? And what determines resistance to airflow is the diameter of the bronchioles. What determines resistance to airflow? The diameter of the bronchioles. So what has happened to the diameter of the bronchioles as a result of you sucking in a cat hair ball? It got smaller. So if the bronchial diameter got smaller, What's going to happen to resistance to airflow? It's going to go up. So now you have to create a greater airway pressure. So people start breathing like, <gasps> to overcome that resistance. Say yes. Okay. This is the hallmark of asthma. Normally, if you look at this would be a side view of the bronchial, air in the bronchioles, likes to flow in a layered fashion, a laminar fashion. But as a result of you having asthma, the bronchial muscle will spasm and the wall will become wavy. So air no longer flows in a laminar fashion. It flows in a turbulent fashion. And turbulent airflow produces wheezing. That's why people with asthma wheeze. Who's with me? Who's following this? Okay, watch. What does epinephrine do to blood vessels? What does it do to the muscular wall of the bronchioles? Does it cause the muscle to contract or relax? Causes it to relax. So the muscular wall of the bronchial, when you give epinephrine, the muscular wall is going to relax so the bronchial diameter gets bigger. Say yes. What does it do to the blood vessels? It constricts the blood vessels but it causes the bronchial muscle to relax. So think about it. Think about it. You're, when you have epinephrine around, you are scared. You're running or fighting for your life. So do you want the bronchioles to get smaller and you have an asthma attack when you've got to fight somebody? You want that bronchial to dilate so you can get more air in and out. Say yes. So watch. The drugs that they give to treat asthma mimic epinephrine. The drug that they give is called albuterol. Have you ever heard of albuterol? Yep. It works or mimics epinephrine. 
who's with me. So if somebody's having an asthma attack, you want to constrict those blood vessels in the airway so they give you albuterol and your hole, because all of your blood vessels were dilated, was smaller. You got me? Now you suck in some albuterol. What does albuterol, whoops, what does albuterol do, call it A, what does that do to the blood vessels that line your bronchioles? Causes them to constrict. So if they constrict, watch it. What's going to happen to the size of the opening? It will get bigger. And what does epinephrine do or albuterol do to beta-2 receptors? Albuterol is going to bind to beta-2 receptors, yes, and it's going to cause the smooth muscle to relax, and it will cause the bronchioles to get bigger. Say yes. Now watch. If you understand this, you now know pharmacology. So what are the side effects of someone who's taking an albuterol inhaler? What would the side effects be? High blood pressure. What's going to happen to their heart rate? Are they going to be sleeping or are they going to be... They're going to be jittery and shaky because the drugs that are used to dilate the airways mimic epinephrine. And then... Parents can't figure out why Joey, he took his little nebulizer at 9 o'clock and then he's bouncing off the walls at 2 p.m. watching cheaters because he is hyped up or she is hyped up on a drug that mimics epinephrine. Say yes. What caused the asthma in the first place? An allergy. And an allergy is an exaggerated immune response. And what does the immune system produce? Inflammation. Say yes. Anybody ever have a bad back where you had to be put on some uh, steroids? No? Go lift something heavy and then get a bad back and then write this down. Steroids suppress the immune system. I spelled that wrong. Wait, how do you spell immune? There's two M's in immune? Steroids suppress the immune system. What's the primary function of the immune system? To produce inflammation. Say yes. So watch. If you are allergic to cats, right? Here, K, K, and you're going to get an exaggerated immune response. Do you want your immune response to go crazy when you see a cat? No. What suppresses your immune system? Steroids. So that's why people with asthma are always given two types of medicine. They're given a bronchodilator that mimics epinephrine, and then they're given a steroid inhaler. Say yeah. And that suppresses the immune system. So that when you are exposed to cat, hair, K, catty, you don't get that exaggerated immune response. Say yes. Here's the thing. It takes about three to four weeks of continued inhalation of steroid inhalers to suppress the immune system. Three to four weeks. Yes. So what happens? Little Joey, he has an asthma attack. They take him to the emergency room. They give him an albuterol inhaler. Then they give him an IV of solumedrol, which is an IV version of steroids. You got me? Then they write 
the parents' med dose pack, which is prednisone, basically, where they step you down. You got me? And then Joey starts feeling better. So they don't, he's not using the inhaler as much, the albuterol. And the parents stop giving him the steroid inhaler. So now you're going to go back to square one. So if you have a kid with asthma, they, if they come to you and they go, Mom, I'm a breathing mother. I ain't never breathed better in my life. You say, suck on your steroid inhaler. You got to take that every single day. Say, and nobody tells you that. Nobody tells you that. Do they? That's why you got to take it every day. So the newer drugs out there, like Advair, you've heard of Advair, the little disc? That's got a long-acting bronchodilator and a short-acting steroid, so it only takes a couple of days to do that. But asthma's tough. It sucks. Say yes. Tell me that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Yes, if you have asthma, you have allergies. It's an allergy in your respiratory tract. That's why people who have eczema typically have asthma, because eczema is an allergy on your skin. Tell me that makes sense. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the pathophysiology of asthma. That's why if you run out of a steroid inha- or a albuterol inhaler, they tell you to drink coffee because caffeine is broken down to a chemical called xanthine, and xanthine is a bronchodilator. So you give him a couple of cups of coffee and then get his fatty acid to the emergency room. Say, yeah. And just don't have cats. You know what, here's the thing. Like with a dog, watch. If you got a dog and somebody comes into your, tries to break into your house, they're like, rawr, 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 right? A cat, they show them where the good stuff is. Come here, buddy. You know what I mean? And then I had this teacher I work with, right? And she goes, oh, you know, I have cats. And, um, yeah, we went on vacation for like uh, five days. I go, you can leave cats alone? And she goes, you don't know that? I go, why would I know that? I hate cats. So why would I do any research on how long you can live cats alone when I'm a little, right? That's just ridiculous. So we got into a fight. How many people followed that? So watch. Again, if you understand how a drug works, you can predict the side effects. Say yes. So what drug is an absolute contraindication should never be given to a patient with asthma? Beta blockers. Never. Because if you have a beta blocker, then you have an asthma attack and you take your albuterol, the albuterol can't bind to the beta receptor because it's blocked. Say so, yeah. That, ladies and gentlemen, is asthma. And here, here's the other thing, too. Typically, asthma gets worse in cold, dry times. When you suck in cold, dry air, that makes the airways more reactive. That's why people with asthma, if they want to go into sports, they tend to go into sports that are either in the warm weather or they're moist and warm. So they go into swimming or diving. Tell me, they stay away from the cold, dry air. That's how that works. Say, yeah. Okay, that, did I cover all the questions? Rock on. All right. Hey, um, give me like... Uh, Give me like 20 minutes to uh, just give you an, an overview of the digestive system, yeah? 20 minutes and then you can ambulate home, all right? So when's the respiratory quiz? It's a week after, uh, a week from this Tuesday, right? Is it the 14th? The 14th, Okay. Yeah. 
It ain't that bad, right? <laughs> we were trying to you guys you guys got the best looks, right? Yeah, we cut we um did the respiratory system. We cl- right? There you have it. I used to not like the digestive system. Now I like it. It's really weird. How many people like the digestive system? Nobody? <laughs> you could care less, right? I I don't know. All right, can't hang on. And um I'll try to have this downloaded for you too, um, over the weekend. But as soon as you uh ambulate out of here, I'm gonna Start working on your quizzes, and I'll have those graded for you um, by this afternoon. I don't care if I, like, you know, get a fever or, you know, maybe, you know, maybe die. I'm going to get those. Okay, here we go. What's the difference between diet and nutrition? What's diet? What's a diet? No, that's like a, that's stupid. You don't want to cut anything out. You want to eat food. No, no, I'm not talking about the diet. Like, your diet, right? What's your diet? Right, what you eat, yes? What's nutrition? What you get out of what you eat. Say yes. You got that. So, for me... Like beer, it has 0.4 grams of protein. So I take a Sharpie and I X that out and I put 15. My my brother-in-law, he's married to my sister, right? His parents, his parents were um, like, they what, what do they call it when, someone's really they were extremely frugal so they would have these like like go and buy these mass quantities of like ketchup and mustard and stuff like that so i was helping my brother-in-law move some stuff so down the basement he had these cans of mayonnaise and when the expiration date hit he would take a black sharpie (laughs) but like three more months I'm like, who does that? <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, these people that are like these hoarders, man, that's just so weird. It is. Like, uh, yeah, it's a mess. My sister gets so mad at him, too. She publicly humiliates this guy. In public, she calls him fat bastard. Yeah, fat bastard. Did I, can I tell you this real quick story? When I was married, I bought this big house. I didn't buy it. My ex-wife wanted this big house, right? Five bedrooms. And my kid wasn't even born, right? So anyways, my ma came down to see it, and she said, you know, Timmy, why don't you um, decorate it for Christmas? I'm like, ma, I'm working. I ain't got time for that. Well, I'll bring Burphy and Kathy down, right? That's my brother-in-law. So a raw day like this in November, I'm on a ladder, he's on a ladder, he's stringing lights, right? My sister, of course, sitting in a nice warm van. So she rolls down the window. Those aren't straight. Those lights aren't straight. Can't you see that? So she rolls up the window and I look at him. I go, why don't you kill her, man? You've been married for 30 years. If you would have killed her right when you got married, you would have been out for 15 years already. But I think he likes it. I do. I think he likes to be like being abused like that. And she's just awful. And I'm like, God. 
How could you like that? You know? Ugh. But they, they go everywhere together. I mean everywhere. And it's like this, oh. Yeah, I would have had to, <laughs> when they first got married, my sister calls calls me up, Burf hit me, burf hit me. Right? So I said, get him on the phone. I said, you ever touch my sister again, I'll come over and I'll kill you. Right? But there's one more question. What took you so long? She's crazy. <laughs> when my ma died, right, the night she died, there's seven of us in our family, right? So we all went up to my ma, right? And I go, Mom, it's, it's Tim. I love you. I love you too, right? So we all went through it. Then my sister Kathy gets up there. Mom, this is Kathy. I love you. I love all my kids. <laughs> oh, God. She was awful. She has the Guinness Book of World's Records of stringing obscenities together. It's unbelievable. She can just string obscenities. It, it's it's like a it's like a gift. <laughs> God, you know every family, regar- uh, regardless, you always got somebody in there. It's just like they're a little different, you know. Anyways, here we go. How much food should you eat? Until you have it, like, right here. <laughs> Watch. This is the, the simplest way to figure it out. You take your ideal body weight, and you multiply it by 10. That's how many calories are your basal metabolic rate. And your basal metabolic rate is how many calories you burn at rest. People who are in a coma, do you have to feed them? Do you have to feed a person who's in a coma? Yeah, because they still need energy because they're still burning calories. So for me, my ideal body weight is about 120. So you multiply that by 10. So how many calories should I be eating a day? 1,200, right? That's for your basal metabolic rate. Now, if you're really active, right, like you're an athlete or something like that, right? You double or triple that depending on how active you are. But most people, you can use this. You take 1,200 for your basal metabolic rate, and then you take half of that. So that would be another 600. So if you want to weigh 120 pounds, you should be taking in on average about 1,800 calories a day. You got me? And most people... Don't. Most people lie. They do about what they eat. Tim, I don't eat anything and I'm gaining weight. I said, you know what? I'm going to take you on a flight to the National Institute of Health in Atlanta. You are a freak of nature. You are a perpetual motion machine. That's like saying you have a half a tank of gas, you drive 500 miles, and when you get there, you got three quarters of a tank. It don't work that way, right? And people like, well, I don't eat anything. Except you look, you know, in their counter and they have like chips ahoy cookies that are all gone right you have no idea how much you eat during the day and it's just that little nibbling stuff like you know cookies or chips that really add it uh weight on you and here's the other thing fat makes food taste good which you'd rather have a greasy hanger burger or a can of tuna right fat has aromatic compounds in it so when you smell that it you smell 80% of what you taste. That's why when your nose is clogged, you can't taste food as well because what you actually taste is what you smell. Say yes. And fat makes food taste good. Mm -mm. And here's the thing. Is it normal for people to gain weight as they get older? It's not normal, but it's accepted, right? And that's because when you were a kid, you're not riding your bike anymore as an adult. Plus, you know what? You got a little coin in your pocket. So that means you can go to nicer restaurants and eat. Before, you were kind of relying on your parents, right? Now you can say, hey, forget that. I'm going to a nice place. And you know what? People pick on McDonald's. When I was a kid, right, you could eat McDonald's all day because you were running around. These kids now, they don't move. They do this. 
That's what they do. That's why they're checking for type 2 diabetes in elementary and junior high now. They're screening for type 2 diabetes. And here's another thing, especially for boys. Fat produces estrogen. That's why little tubby boys turn into little tubby men, and they don't, like, have a thick beard, and they have kind of rosy cheeks, and they don't um, make as much uh, sperm. So uh, there was this firefighter, right, classic guy, right, and just tubby, and then he got married. And he goes, uh, I'm trying to, me and the wife are trying to have kids. It just ain't happening. I go, let's check your testosterone level. So I check it. It's really low, right? So we started supplementing this testosterone. Comes back a year later. Tim, 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 I, I got the wife pregnant, right? So they're going to have a kid. And he's got a black eye, right? And I go, what happened? Well, me and the wife were out, and some guy said something, so we got in a fight. Testosterone makes guys aggressive. Do you understand? That's what makes guys aggressive. It makes them stupid. Right? Let's fight. I used to be like that. Me and my buddy, my buddy Danny Poole, he looks like uh, Eddie Murphy, only he's like taller. We would go into these bars. Dude, dude, look at that guy. Giving me manly looks. Let's get in a fight. I'm like, come on. Right? So we get in a fight. And then his buddy would try to jump in, so I would have to protect my buddy. And then this one guy goes, I ain't never lost a fight. And I go, well, I have. <laughs> I used to fight all the time. You know, I'm Irish, right? The Irish people are the only people who embrace their stereotype of drinking and fighting. My uncle Tim and my uncle Pat, they owned a body shop down in Kenosha. I had my 1974 Chevy Nova. I was in high school, right? I bring it in. I go, hey, Uncle Tim, it's running rough. Can you look at it? Oh, yeah, sure, Timmy, no problem. So my Uncle Pat comes in, and they start arguing about what's wrong with it. So they start picking up wrenches and throwing them at each other with intent. And I'm like, they get in this fight. And I'm like, and we go to my grandpa's uh, for Christmas, right, Christmas Eve. What did my uncles do? They drink, and then they get the fight all the time, Right? The fighting Irish, right? A leprechaun like this. And the Irish people, they don't say nothing. And Freud said the only people who cannot be psychoanalyzed are the Irish. They're probably too far gone. <laughs> my mom's 100% Irish. My old man's like like 70% Irish. right? My mom's maiden name is Callahan. Yeah, and we have... Kathleen, Colleen, Maureen, Lauren, Sean, and then Timeline. Anyways, I digress. Here we go. Watch. Watch. What happens to people as they get older? Like older, like 70s, 80s. Do they gain weight or lose weight? 70s or 80s? They lose weight, right? And the reason they lose weight is because they ain't got no more teeth assists. They ain't got no teeth. And the funnest part of eating is tearing into food. Would you rather have a nice juicy, juicy steak you're chewing on or a steak that's pureed? Sucking it through a straw. Just the thought of that makes you want to vomit bile, right? So one of the big parts of eating is the act of chewing that food. People like to chew food. And watch, as you age, the amount of saliva that you produce decreases, and the only way that you can um, taste food is to dissolve it in saliva. So, the, And they get that old people breath. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. And you get those dentures. Ooh. There ain't nothing good about getting old. Nothing. Name one thing good about getting old. <clears throat> right. Nothing. Now, I, I used to always think that when you look at a guy that was like my age, you know, and I was a kid, and I'm like, God, that person must be so smart. They live life. They got to be so smart. Then I realized, no, that ain't the case. <laughs> 
Okay. Watch. Write this down. Your entire GI tract is considered outside your body. It is a hole through your body. Say yes. So anything that is secreted into the GI tract is considered outside your body. Now, if a gland secretes into the blood, it's called an endocrine gland. Pancreas secretes insulin and glucagon into the blood. So does the pancreas is a, the pancreas an endocrine gland? The pancreas also secretes digestive enzymes into the digestive tract. And because the digestive tract is considered outside your body, any gland that secretes outside your body is called an exocrine gland. So the pancreas is both an endocrine and exocrine gland. Say, uh, okay, watch. What's the entire GI tract made out of? Nice. It's made out of muscle. And the muscle that makes up the GI tract itself contracts rhythmically. What's it called? when it contracts rhythmically to propel that food from your mouth down to your toilet. Wait, it's P-E-R. It's called peristalsis. Peristalsis is the rhythmic contraction and relaxation of the muscular walls of the GI tract. So when you hear what you think is your stomach gurgling, that's peristaltic waves moving fluid and partially digested food. Tell me you got that. Yeah? Of the muscular walls of the GI tract. So the GI tract itself is a hollow muscular tube. If you were to rip up somebody's esophagus, stomach, small intestines, large intestines, and rectum, and pull it straight, you could see through it, assuming there's not a turd in the way. <laughs> Say yes. All right. So let me just take you on a little bit of a journey here, and then you can ambulate. All right, watch. When you swallow food, what's the little flap of cartilage that covers your trachea? the epiglottis. So that food is going to get into your esophagus, which is a hollow muscular tube, and then the hollow muscular tube of the esophagus is going to rhythmically contract and propel that food into the stomach. What's the big, thick, dome-shaped muscle that separates completely the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity? The diaphragm. So how does the esophagus that's in the thoracic cavity get to the stomach if the diaphragm's in the way. What? Ooh, close. Watch. There is a hole in the diaphragm, dear Liza, dear Liza. That hole is called the esophageal hiatus. A hiatus means a hole, right? If you are on a hiatus from work, there is a hole in your work schedule. Have you ever heard of a hiatal hernia? That's where the top part of the stomach ruptures through and makes that hole bigger, and now the, the top part of your stomach is in the thoracic cavity. 
That's a hiatal hernia. Okay. So, watch. Then you have the esophagus, and it is connected to the stomach. Now, watch. And Cora, that was good. Now write this down. I mean this, right? Every distinct section of the GI tract, every distinct section of the GI tract is separated by a circular band of muscle called a sphincter. That's a good word. What's that? Sphincter. Sphincter. Yeah. He's a sphincter. As a matter of fact, that's the word of the day. If you see a security guard and you say sphincter, they'll give you money. Maria. Right? What was the word? Oh, ejection fraction. Yeah. So she saw a security guard, said ejection fraction, and gave him a dollar. Give her a dollar, right? Yep. See? I think I'm making this up. Uh, if you stay around till like 2.30, studying, if you see Terry, the custodian, he's the one with the ponytail, if you say that to him, he'll give you money. Not even kidding, right? Okay. So watch. The stomach is separated from the esophagus by a sphincter called the whoops called the lower esophageal sphincter. Yes? Okay now watch. Watch. I'm just gonna tell you this. I'll explain more later. The stomach produces what's this? What is it? Name it. At hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid has a very low pH. The pH of hydrochloric acid is about 1. Very, very acidic. Who's with me? What's the stomach made out of? Muscle. What happens to muscle when it, it's exposed to a very, very low pH. That was good. Not right, but you said it with a lot of confidence. First of all, what's muscle made out of? Protein. Tell me you got that. What does hydrochloric acid do to the muscular wall of that stomach? It will begin to break it down. Does your hydrochloric acid that you produce in your stomach break down your stomach? No, it doesn't. That's because, watch, in the lining of your stomach, you have these specialized cells, watch it, called, uh-oh, uh-oh. Can you see that? That's a terrible color. I'm going to have a good color. Goblet cells. What do goblet cells produce? Mucus. And those goblet cells, before you eat, num, 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 they produce a mucus, and that mucus prevents the hydrochloric acid from eating away at your stomach. Say yes. How many people followed this? Now watch. Watch. How many people eat late at night? How many people drink? You guys don't drink? Like alcohol? How do you live like that? You drink alcohol? Good. Put, put plus five. <laughs> Anyone who drinks up plus five. Okay, so... Watch. What's the esophagus made out of? What's the little sphincter made out of? 
What's muscle made out of? What's digested in your stomach? What nutrient? Protein, right? Why doesn't the wall of your stomach get digested along with your cheeseburger? They produce that protective mucus lining. Now watch. If you eat late at night, you're going to get that protective mucus lining. But when you go to bed, the stomach contents with the hydrochloric acid, how are most people during the day upright, depending on your profession, right? So now you got the stomach acid at the bottom. Now you go to bed, night, God bless Timmy, and then you go to bed, that stomach contents will come to the top part of your stomach. And because the mucus kind of falls off the top part of the stomach, that mucus now no longer protects your stomach. And it will begin to erode that little sphincter muscle, and the contents in the stomach will reflux into the esophagus. You get gastroesophageal reflux disease. That's why they tell you if you got heartburn, not to eat at night, late at night, not to drink. And if you smoke, smoke nicotine stimulates the production of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. It also stimulates peristalsis. That's why when people back in the day when you could smoke anywhere, when they had to go take a dump, they'd be lighting up a cigarette, smoking the cigarette, because that stimulates peristalsis. Caffeine stimulates peristalsis. So people, when they got to go, a cup of coffee, a couple of puffs, here, and then they go. Say, yeah. So people with heartburn, their doctor tells you, don't eat late at night, don't be drinking, and actually put some bricks underneath the head of your bed so that when you sleep, you kind of sleep at a little bit of an angle to keep those stomach contents lower. Say, yeah. Also, studying and reading the textbook reduces the production of hydrochloric acid, not even playing. Did a study on that. Say, yeah. All right. Okay, we'll leave it there today. Um, do me a favor. Do me a favor. Uh, what's today? Wednesday? Oh, today's Thursday? Okay. Uh, so, Tuesday, uh, bring your... Um, Lab book and your textbook because we're going to be working in the... Oh, wait, we got the midterm, right? Okay. Okay. All right, so on Thursday, bring your lab book and textbook because part of the class I'm going to have you work in, be working in the lab. Getting, um, I want to go... I'll go over the parts of the digestive tract uh, with you in lab and then you guys have at it, okay? All right. And I'm going to work right now on getting those tests graded for you. I will, I promise.